My name is Allison McDowell and I'm I'm a mom. I, I live in Philadelphia. I spend a lot of time um, doing independent research um, and following money. And a lot of my work as an activist started out around the privatization of public schools in Philadelphia, um, which was sort of, I used to just be a mom that would help volunteer in the schools. And I work half time, and so I do have a chunk of time to devote to other things, and, and that's a great privilege. And so initially I was just working to support my child's um, neighborhood school, and eventually in 2013, um, Boston Consulting Group uh, recommended for the closure of about 23 schools in the city, and it threw everything into upheaval, laid off 3,000 teachers, and uh, was really devastating for for the district, for the educators, for the families who are kind of coming to grips with that. And then later that summer, um, that happened in the spring, um, they the district hired a consultant to come in and do um, start pitching this idea of school report cards, grading schools, um, and it would impact the regular public schools and not the charter schools. And so um, we sort of organized in opposition to that. Um, that work was um, underwritten by the Dell Foundation, uh, Michael Dell, uh, Dell Computers. Dell, Dell Computers works with a major contractor to the NSA. <laughs> and, um, and so those public meetings were shut down. And so in response, I sort of jumped into working with um, education activists around opposing standardized testing. And so that was sort of my first big effort. And I was coordinated actually with um, a national group because this was happening nationally at the time through United Opt Out um, and Peggy Robertson, um, who's actually based in Colorado. And so we connected sort of this loose coalition of parents who were trying to oppose the use of both the standardization of education curriculum as well as the weaponization of scores against schools to close schools. And I did that for a while, um, but then realized that really the end game was shifting more towards all the time data collection on students through educational technology. So then my focus shifted towards um, looking into the ed tech as a global industry and what it meant for both surveillance um, of content delivered in the classroom, the commodification of children as data, and then again the use of the data collected to further privatize public education. Um, so a lot of that work, I, I blogged at wrenchinthegears.com, that's, that's the blog that I have. And um, over time I realized that really, even though I had come into it through public education, that this issue of commodifying people as data and doing the sort of digital control and disciplinary mechanisms was really part of a much larger global financial apparatus. Um, and one of the parents that I organized with um, is, is Sherry Honkalush. We were, our kids were in the same school at the same time and she um, has been doing work around housing rights and um, rights of the poor, organizing the poor for decades um, and doing really amazing work outside the system. So we connected and then my lens just expanded much more broadly that this wasn't simply about controlling public schools and children and families and educators, but it was really about um, creating systemic global poverty and then managing that. Um, so that's that's sort of how I came into things. So now it's gone from poverty management to pandemic, which is creating poverty. <laughs> Just keeps getting bigger. What, what did you say, the weaponization of data? What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, so, so Eric Schmidt, former chair, I believe, of Alphabet, Google's parent company, I mean, has said, you know, data is the new oil. And, and I think that's sort of this common understanding at this point that um, you know, we're reaching peak petroleum, this next extractive resource is, is data. Um, and a lot of the data in the world, increasingly as we smart up <laughs> with sensors and things, our environment, and even like our phones are just a very basic sensor mechanism, um, our interactions with devices, with sensors embedded in the built environment, amongst sensors, that's all generating data. And the entities that can capture and analyze that data have tremendous power. Um, one of the things that I got into when, when I was working in the education front, um, so ultimately when I was doing testing, I realized that wasn't the answer. That wasn't gonna be, withholding the test wasn't gonna be the thing to stop it because then they moved into this technology. So I, the lesson I learned at that point was like they would like for you to do the work for them <laughs> to their end. Like you have to think a couple steps ahead because they have like a 20 or 30 year plan. And if, if they can give you a little lead on 
a controlled opposition, even though you may not understand that that's what you're doing, like they'll let you advance their agenda to a certain point. And so I didn't want that to happen again. And what I saw happening was there was a huge organization around data privacy, student data privacy. Um, and while I'm very much in support of the premise of data privacy, um, for me, the larger philosophical context is they would like for us to ask to become digital commodities. Like those in power would like to, to offer us privacy in exchange for having our life turned into data so that they can extract value from that. But it has to be a mutual agreement that we will agree to be a data commodity. And so it's sort of a false choice around data privacy um, that we will get privacy, but then essentially it won't stop the educational technology. It won't stop telemedicine. It won't stop teletherapy. We'll still have to live in a digital world, but somehow we will, we can sell ourselves as data. Um, and so when I talk about weaponization, like there are subtle nuances. They like to frame the argument in certain ways. And, and well, I probably lean Luddite. I mean, at this point, a lot of the educational process that I do with people is through digital. Like I'm not saying like it's, a, it's easy to completely walk away from it, but I'm trying to say that living in a world of data is a world of sort of binary decision trees that, that are only a shadow of the actual world and a shadow of actual relationships. And by buying into that, we're allowing ourselves to live in their apparatus that they have constructed. Like Google builds a really nice box. <laughs> it's got a lot of bells and whistles. It's fun, it can do things, we can share stuff, but ultimately it's Google's box. So we're not gonna be able to conceive of things outside of Google's box if we decide to live there. And um, so th these are questions. I don't tell people how to think about it, but these are the things I think about. Um, and this data, so that's the commodification piece. The other piece is a book that was really influential for me is Yasha Levine's book, Surveillance Valley, and it's a military history of the internet. And if you understand the internet as a militarized space, um, it puts a very different spin on things. And if you understand that is both the, this intersection of corporate, the corporate state and the militarist state and sort of potentially predatory philanthropy are, are all operating in this digital space that feels really cool, but also has a lot of risks that people are not aware of if you don't know the historical context. And you have to consider the power and who actually in a cloud computing world, even though we'd like to imagine it's decentralized with blockchain and different things, the people who are in control of the cloud, it's a very small number of people, mostly a lot of white guys, not exclusively, but um, that power is highly concentrated and to operate in that space means to operate in their world. You said something a minute ago that I thought was interesting, uh, predatory philanthropy. So you want to t t tell me a little bit about like, what do you mean by predatory philanthropy? Wealth around the world is concentrated in the hands of these billionaires, right? Who are making all of this money, you know, even under the present circumstances of the COVID situation. Um, they all have very large um, philanthropic pieces. They can use those assets to influence public policies that influence that benefit their companies as well. Additionally, so within a foundation you have, there's two elements to it. There's PRI um, and MRI. So um, there are, there's the endowment money and then there's the money that they distribute in grants. So Bill Gates, even within his philanthropy, his endowment of the Gates Foundation is invested in for-profit prisons. I mean, many very problematic things that those philanthropic monies are invested in to create these assets that then can be distributed in grants that are used to influence public policy in ways that are disproportionate to the general public. Um, they can use these monies to put them into nonprofit institutions that are then, even though they may not feel it directly, somewhat obligated to comply with the wishes of the funders. Um, and and there's, a, there's a good book that says, you know, the revolution will not be funded. <laughs> um, if you are doing, proposing a radical solution that would redistribute power away from this handful of people that maintain all of the power, they're not going to fund you. 
So if we have a general understanding that the issues in the world are these issues of domination that are exerted by corporate interests, transnational global capital interests largely, who are operating like even beyond a national context, um, that's where the, the power is. And anything that threatens that power will be cut off. So there's this idea that through grants and things, you can sort of have the cardboard check, glittery gala, feel good, pat on the back, doing good work. Um, but the reality is, is that many of these companies are making profits off of the misery of the global populace. And if we actually redistributed resources in a way to ameliorate poverty, their businesses would be harmed. Um, so we've got sort of these global poverty management complexes that are run through well-meaning, often nonprofits, but are limited by the fact that they're funded by entities that have no real desire for poverty and immiseration to end. I mean, also Bill Gates is funding like GMO seeds. <laughs> like he's funding, he's funding the privatization of public education. Uh, you know, there are many elements of these policies that might be something that one individual person feels is good for everyone else, but many people realize it's a huge problem. So again, that's one person who's exerting disproportionate influence over the lives of millions of people. And it's very hard to, like, we didn't elect Bill Gates to anything. <laughs> we didn't. And there's no way to get at Bill Gates or at Eric Schmidt or at New America or at these think tanks. There's no way to get at them because at this point, like, you know, and I don't know, you know, it goes back very far in terms of influence, but the government is operating with these partners in sort of shadowy back corners in a way that the general public will never get to. We'll, we'll never get those invitations to Davos. Like, we'll never know. We're not meant to know what goes on there. And that's, those aren't people we can elect out. So th what's interesting about this is people that I know who are all about the, you know, democracy and representation and government and, um, you know, government by the people, you know, the idea of government, not necessarily the ac actual reality of it, um, are also the same people that support Bill Gates and, and these, you know, they're benevolent and as, as a force of good and there's a disconnect there because on one hand they're cheerleading the idea of a democracy while celebrating this incredibly undemocratic uh, setup, yeah. <laughs> arrangement. I mean for me, like I said, my, my entry point was in through the public schools and I could see the grave harm that was being done. And, and I mean, I, I give Bill Gates credit, he actually has all of his grants on his website, right? So you can go in and in different project areas, look and see the hundreds of millions of dollars going into all sorts of things. Now, my scope up until recently wasn't looking at their global health initiatives, right? Like I was looking at schools, which was big enough. It was a huge. And even like trying to scratch the surface of global health and vaccine programs and other things, there's just whole other elements that open up. Um, but money is power. And, and that money and power is, is very concentrated. So I would, I would say if you go to any of the major foundations and you start to peel back where their grants are from, you can see how they can control things. Um, you know, Hewlett Packard is an entity that very few people, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, it's not really one of those top ones that you hear, you know, pointed out. Um, but they're very influential, essentially. They have restructured the nonprofit industry to be data driven to run these human capital markets that are coming. And so I spent a good couple months just essentially entering um, all the data around these grants to nonprofits into this database system so that I could track it. And you can see, you could see, this is how they bought all of the identity politics organizations. You know, this is how they bought all of the philanthropic news media. This is how they bought, you know, all of the online giving programs. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, can, you can actually map it by mapping the money and, and it, the nature of it, it appears. And, and there are so many people who tell me, Allison, this isn't coordinated. You know, this can't, there can't be a place where everyone's planning this out. And I'm like, no, there is. It's Davos, it's Necker Island. There are groups of people who are at this high level who maybe not 
they don't all have all the parts, but they definitely have the overall strategy of what the plan is. And they have like a 20 to 30 year, maybe 50 year plan of how this is gonna roll out. And then they have backup plans depending on what the resistance is. So yes, it isn't conspiracy. It's not hidden if you actually spend the time to look at the money, which is what I do and, and which is why I'm not just taking somebody else's word for it. I'm actually looking at what they're saying in their white papers, in their grant projects, in their boards, and seeing how it's playing out in the real world. Mm -hmm. The resistance will not come from the middle class. No, I, At the beginning, it certainly won't. It's going to come from the people who have been systematically, who, who are, if we can get to a point that people's basic needs are met enough that they can c collectively resist. To try to convince the middle class of what's happening, most people, I'm not a normal person. Right. For whatever reason, I, I you know, I saw this and I can't walk away from it. Yeah. So, but that's not most people. I think was it impact investing that kind of got you kind of like seeing beyond just, oh, it's just beyond just like the, the standardized testing or whatever. What was kind of the next step for you? I'm trying to remember how I first got to looking at, at pay for success. Um, mm -hmm. One of my, my mentors, um, his name is Tim Scott, wrote a couple of pieces that touched on social impact bond finance. Um, and this was at the time where I was looking into educational technology and Gates was, was sort of part of that. There's a very compelling uh, presentation I recommend to everyone online and it's uh, Justin Leroy, who, who I believe is uh, an academic, a professor at UC Santa Barbara now, um, called, it, it was about social impact bonds and the afterlife of slavery. And what was really interesting was the context of that talk. So um, there was an exhibit at the Whitney um, I'm trying to remember the exact year, maybe 2016, where Cameron Rowland, who's actually a Philadelphia artist, um, he does work around found objects and ready-made and in relation to the carceral state and racial capitalism. And that's sort of his work. And so this was an exhibit around debt. And he had used his apportionment uh, to make art to actually buy um, a share in the social impact bond, which was targeting incarcerated youth in Ventura County, which is interesting because that's one of the county that's coming up with the COVID stuff now. Um, and so he bought, he, he, he bought and then he, because that was the only way to get the terms of this social impact bond conference and uh, contract, and he framed it and he put it on the wall of the Whitney. And he asked Justin Leroy to come and speak as part of the, the um, exhibit. And so this, this talk was given and it really, sort of hit home that what we're looking at now with the turning of people into data and using predictive analytics to essentially set up these larger systems to gamble on people's lives. And, and this is something that's happening um, as a re direct result of automation of labor and sort of globalized labor management processes. Um, this is the outgrowth of the carceral state. This is what's coming next are these social impact finance tied to different forms of state control that are outside of prison systems, but also really brutal, um, was that it's this legacy, it's this arc on which our nation is built and which I think is below the surface in many ways. And I think people who are, you know, tend to sort of say, you know, rely on the constitutional rights and, you know, the good of democracy um, are co often conveniently sort of forget that the wealth and power of this country was built on land theft of the indigenous nations and genocide of indigenous people and enslavement of black people and family separation of those families and then unfree labor and forced labor, like up until very recently. And so those pieces, when we sort of go back to the constitution, um, don't apply. And the constitution is really written to, to protect the property rights of powerful white men. Um, and many of which founding fathers were real, real estate speculators. So where we are now with Trump um, is, is very much part of that larger trajectory. And so that is why, um, for me, understanding human capital finance and understanding that it is embedded in um, the way in which we were so brutal to indigenous people and black people is central to understanding like now this system has gotten to the point that it's coming after everyone. And we need to both reconcile with that history and really own it, and, or, and then and also to look to those ongoing resistance strategies to enslavement um, as we move forward and try to come to some 
resolution and, and be allies in that process, if that makes sense. I mean, that's my personal understanding and the framing of it, but. And the, and the challenge here is this issue is just splinters off into so many other things. I know. I was, as yeah, you were sorry. talking, no, it's okay. As, as you were talking, I was thinking about some of the things that he was saying in his talk about um, insurance and seeing the, seeing humans as as commodities that 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 can be discarded or or kept or that that that's even an option. Right. It's the commodification of humanity, and and that's what's really interesting because there's another. Um, academic Calvin Schirmerhorn who has a really good talk about supply cha chains and supply chains, commodity chains and supply chains, about um, looking at the finance, the innovative banking um, that was associated with the transportation, the brutal relocation of black enslaved people from the Chesapeake Bay area into sugar plantations. And that at the time in the, the early 19th century, there wasn't a common currency and the ways in which Northern finance played this intermediary process in terms of making these financial trades happen. Um, and so moving forward, I, I feel very strongly that blockchain, um, these, this idea of the trusted third party is going to be replacing in an automated way these sort of northern financiers and, and in these human capital bonds that are going to be coming online through these central banking systems. And, you know, I don't put it, I don't really think that the people at Warden and <laughs> Stanford are looking at 18th century um, bank finance around the domestic slave trade, but it's very eerie at how close it is um, that these sort of these um, patterns, these cycles keep coming back. And, and there's a term that I would encourage people to look up that really helps um, me think about it. It's called hypothecation, and that was in Calvin Schirmerhorn's, this idea of being able to draw capital out of human bodies. Um, while the person who owns them still maintains use of that body. So like mortgaging against humanity um, while still controlling that humanity. And I think that's gonna be something that's gonna be key moving forward with these um, pay for success deals and these human capital bonds is hypothecation. Hmm, I've never heard that term. What's, what are the arguments they make for, for this? Why, uh, you know, it seems, you know, if I were to listen to you, I'd be like, wow, that sounds like a terrible idea. We shouldn't do that. Uh, so why do you think it, it connects with people or why do you think it, it, it you know, what are the arguments that they make that, that are, you know, that, that, that we should be doing this or, or, or is it just because it's all done behind the scenes or what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the human capital finance mechanism that's, that's, I believe will probably be likely to roll out in the aftermath of sort of this global economic reset. Um, you know, they pitch UBI, universal basic income, as this, they've been sort of preparing the ground for that for the past few years. And, um, you know, I think they want people to believe there's no strings attached to that, or they're just giving you like a suitcase of cash, a thousand bucks, it's not going to be that. It'll be tied to digital currency. And within that, like very much conditioned on how you can use that money. And, and, and within blockchain systems, there are ways of actually programming money through tokens. You know, you can use this amount for rent, you can move this amount for food. You know, um, it, it really is very limiting. Um, I would say this idea of universal basic income or blockchain identity or decentralized, like you can become your own data commodity. There's part of it that is very appealing to sort of the traditional American mindset. Like if you just curate your own brand, like you can beat out all of the other people on the block to be the most desirable data commodity out there and everyone will clamor to, you know, and that's, you know, the, the YouTuber culture, you know, these, these online celebrity cultures is that it's all about this digital branding. Um, but the reality is, is that the resources are still concentrated in the hands of these few powerful people. It's not, they're not giving us any more of their money. And in fact, they're using these systems to further concentrate their wealth and power and, and, and impose austerity at the bottom level. So I think in one way, they, they wanna sell this American dream of bootstrapping and just for the digital age. And like, you know, if you're just really good, you can, if you're, if you're really disciplined and you're really good, you can make it work. Um, even though they control the structural apparatus and you're working within their structure, even if they, it's ostensibly you know, decentralized. Um, and that's appealing for a lot of people. A lot of people just like wanna be free, free operators. They, wanna, they don't wanna feel like they have obligations to other people or part of these larger webs networks. Um, I mean, for me, it feels like there's like the digital life, which is sort of an anti-life status, and then 
there's the real life, which is is messy, but also powerful. <laughs> and so there's, we're, we're sort of diverging. Like there's the people who are taking the cyborg track of like living in the virtual world and then people who are like resisting the cyborg track. And I don't know how it's gonna all play out. Because it's hard because increasingly they're pushing everybody into the cyborg track. And if you, if you want to like live outside of that, live not with a digital payment system, live not with a digital identity, um, it's hard to imagine where that can happen. And that's why I'm trying to like connect with people who are also trying to imagine how that could happen because I, I think there are a lot of people who given a choice wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. So what evidence do you have that um, the UBI will have strings attached? Because it sounds to me like, I'm, I'm being devil's yeah. advocate here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a great thing. We're going to help everybody out. We're going to give them money, and it'll keep the economy going. And <laughs> beware, be candid. They they always give you the little, they dangle the stuff free, and then they change up the terms later. Um, well, so there's something called the Better Than Cash Alliance. Gates is backing it, and Mastercard, and a, and a number of sort of larger credit. They're pushing global digital payment systems. And if you understand how sort of capital works, it's based on it's predicated on continued growth, and within these digital spaces, like faster and smaller and more atomized and fast, everything speeds up, everything grows and everything has to speed up. And so these um, blockchain payments, um, blockchain allows, the way they pitch it is that it allows the, the micro payments, like tiny fractions of a penny and, and you know, it's fast and instantaneous, even though it isn't quite there yet, but this is how they're imagining that this will be at some point, um, these sort of immediate cross-border payment systems, and we're all part of this globalized world. And, and I think, while I definitely feel solidarity with people around, people around the world, I think we can all agree that like globalization and structural adjustment has been horrible for people around the world. So like, there are issues around globalized payment systems, especially when they're controlled by like, global creditors and global financial banks and the World Bank. Um, so the Better Than Cash Alliance, and I've, I've done some write-ups on them, but you know, one of the reports specifically says, like, we need government to jumpstart this. Like, we, we, we can't do it on our own to get this global digital payment system. So we think the toe in the door is like government to people payments. And so if you can start creating governments issuing payments to citizens, like that's what's gonna get it, get it going. Um, I believe very strongly that the, um, the phones that are given to low-income people are to make that possible because a, a lot of those cash assistance benefits will be digitally platformed and that's going in that direction. Um, and there has been a big push over the past few years to make sure like all low-income people have a smartphone, which again, I'm not against I'm, I'm not trying to restrict people's access to that, but in order for this new program of human capital work, people have to have their digital surveillance device and they have to have their benefits on a phone. So they need a phone. Um, that's the cost of you know, this, this model moving forward. Um, so Gates is involved in something called Moja Loop, and they're trying out different things with like, I think heating assistance in Bangladesh. They've got different pilots in different parts of the world. And I think a lot of times people you know, who are in comfortable situations would just see like, oh, that's, that's in that other country. That's a, that's, that doesn't have any relevance to me. But what we have to understand is in a world of cloud-based computing, once they have the architecture set up, like they can just upload that and it can be in any country within a week, really. Once they have the pilot online and they're comfortable that it works, it, it is cross-border. There isn't really anything to limit that. So, um, so like I said, Better Than Cash is already working on that. Um, you know, we're seeing things come up with the digital dollar and the digital wallets that were tried to slip in with the, the COVID um, payments that got back down, but I'm sure it'll pop back up again. Um, in Australia, they're actually putting their disability benefits on blockchain with tokens and using programmable money. So if you, if you look up programmable money and, bl and blockchain, it's, it's a thing. And, and I really don't, well, I mean, maybe a tiny bit of UBI would be totally unconditional. But these systems of power want to exert more and more control because ultimately their goal is to engineer behavior. And this is tied, and I, I haven't spoken to this yet, but the, the pay for success finance structure and turning people into data and then engineering them on dashboards, sort of representing their life and their behaviors on a dashboard to gamble on for global markets. Um, they need to control 
continue to exert more and more control so they can get more and more data so they can do more and more of these deals. What, what is programmable money? I know you're, you know a lot about money. <laughs> so my sense is that the concept of currency is about to undergo a very different, a very big change. Um, and the idea of fiat currency is going to change and that these tokens, which are represented, you know, in, in blockchain, like Ethereum smart contracts are assets, uh, any kinds of assets that you can ascribe onto a, you know, this digital item that can be transferred. Um, and it's almost limitless the the, ass, the types of assets you can assign to a token. Um, and a lot of this is linked to virtual world building and gaming economies, like virtual reality, video gaming economies, these ideas of leveling up and scoring and securing items, digital items that might unlock other things, privileges and things. So um, programmable money is, is like, having assets that are assigned only a certain use, like you can only use this token to do this thing. Um, and it's trackable, it's on this ledger, so it can be um, tracked over time and used to both make, prof like to profile people and make decisions about people. Essentially it's tracking actions in the world on a ledger. And I think assigning value to that action that is trackable. Um, so one of the things I do, like I'm a real geek, <laughs> like it, sometimes you, you do a lot of work and you don't know where you're going to find the thing that unlocks the next important thing that you discover. Right. And so new America had, um, a year, a couple years ago, I think a, a whole day event on blockchain, um, with the world bank. Okay. So it was like sitting through four hours of the world bank discussions on blockchain. But it was really helpful to understand, and a lot of this was linked to global aid systems, because a lot of this is, these systems are being piloted through global aid channels, through USAID and UK AID, um, ostensibly to sort of you know, ensure transparency and tracking of this aid product. Um, but one of the individuals in the presentation was from an organization called Trust Lab, and they had done a proof of concept in Cape Town, South Africa, to create a blockchain identity system for pre-K children. And so the premise in this, this program, which is this pilot, which is underway, um, is that there would be sort of this corporate franchise childcare program. The government would reimburse providers, um, but it was based on attendance. And so what they told all of the service providers was that you, you weren't gonna do it on paper anymore, um, that we were gonna have an app and that every child would be assigned a unique identifier, a digital identity, and all the teachers would be, and the school would be, and it would all be tracked on this app, which is a very simple transaction, but it would be a token. So whenever the child attended pre-K that day, this blockchain token was transferred, an impact token, and then there would be a government reimbursement to the provider. The thing is, there were this third piece in there of investors in the pre-K program. And these are social impact investors and human capital investors. And we have to understand that pre-K would fall under the UN Sustainability Development Goal number four, which is education. So impact investors are investing their money in these human capital assets that manifest as pre-K. And so this transactional data, which they are getting a payout for if you can improve the human capital quality of these children through delivering this evidence-based pre-K program is knit into their global financial returns. But essentially then that child becomes a mechanism within this larger global financial apparatus and their behavior of showing up to pre-K and enabling these blockchain tokens to transfer both to pay the service provider and document for the impact investment um, that's what I'm talking about tokens. Like, so there's a value element in there, but it's not looking like a dollar or a Euro or anything that we would traditionally conceive of as 
a payment. It's, it's behavior tracked through tokens that will unlock a future payment that is agreed upon maybe in some financial contract somewhere. So uh, someone that would support this would say, yeah, but what's the problem? Um, we have, we're, we're, we're getting Wall Street to suddenly care about this success of young people. I'm just, yeah. So, so, you know, what would you say to that? They say, well, what would, you know, whereas before they didn't care, now they can actually, you're actually incentivizing them to care about the success. You know, I'm just saying that. Yeah, that, no, no, no. I mean, what would you say to that? Essentially, what we've created is a world where, again, this wealth is concentrated, and the people with the most, most money and the most wealth will continue to make even more based on immiserating the broad people. Like, this system isn't set up to eliminate poverty because what they've created is a global market in managing poverty. So, it will never eliminate poverty. Goldman Sachs has no incentive to eliminate poverty if they're making a good seven to 11% rate of return on poverty, right? Like you might ameliorate it, you might make it less brutal, but you don't actually stop it. And so what this looks like, um, there's a social impact bond, a pre-K social impact bond. One of the first ones was in Salt Lake City. And this is all connected through also the United Way. Um, they're a major partner in this. And so they developed um, an impact program for pre-K um, in the Salt Lake area. Um, and what was done was they agreed to screen several hundred children for those that would be good qualifying impact, you know, opportunity kids. And then they gave them access to pre-K that was underwritten by Goldman Sachs. Um, and of the hundred kids that ended up getting the pre-K program, and I'm not sure if it was one or two years, um, only one of them, so the cost offset was special education. And, um, they had assigned a cost of how, how costly special education would be for children and say, oh, well, if you give them pre-K, they won't need special education later. And we're gonna save all this money by not needing to deliver special education, which is kind of a bogus argument that they're necessarily connected. So of these 100 kids that got the pre-K program, which was a pretty bare bones program, only one of them, when they enrolled in kindergarten, qualified for special education. And Goldman Sachs netted a whole bunch of money off of that. So I know through my work in education that you can game any numbers and data that, to make your case. And so what happens is, is that the impact metrics for these deals are set such that they're scalable, um, they're narrow, and they're gonna advantage the investor. Um, and then you, and you can play around with the numbers. You can push kids out, you can push kids in, you can do things to make the numbers look like you want them to work. And that's the same that's always happened with charter schools and test scores and everything else. They're there to be manipulated. Um, so of those hundred kids and only one got special edu screened into ed special education, you have to wonder, and this was even in the New York Times questioning these impact metrics. Did they screen kids in who never would have needed special education? Like maybe they were, um, English was not their first language and they just needed time to catch up on English. Like they, did, they weren't gonna need special education. Were these kids who did need special education and aren't gonna get it because it's disincentivized? You know, are they getting denied services because it would disadvantage Goldman Sachs to get those services? Um, and so there are huge questions around what this means. And then even within Ampli, and this program is backed by UNICEF, um, they're framing it as giving a child a chance to build their social capital. Well, that's a really messed up situation when essentially what you're saying is like, we know how racialized these systems are already is that, you know, this child is already pre-profiled as a potential burden on society <laughs> before they've even, you know, they're, they're three years old and they're already a potential burden on society. We've decided, our data analytics have decided based on your zip code, your parents, data, your genomics eventually, you're a burden. You're our burden and we're fixed that burden. It's incredibly paternalistic. And so what we need is a society where the resources are not all locked up in these mega transnational global capital entities that are not accountable to anyone, underwriting systems that are very narrow, because the other piece of this is it's not just um, sort of stripped down in-person pre-K, they're also developing online pre-K. And this is Waterford Upstart. This is being used in the city of Philadelphia right now on refugee families. They're pushing poor kids, refugee kids into online preschool 
because it's an impact market. It's a data profiling market. These kids don't have a chance to say no thank you. <laughs> I'd prefer not to have a digital identity. I prefer not to be your data commodity. It's incredibly predatory and there are a lot of ethical questions about that. I mean, the other piece is they need new ways of getting data. And this is these, the pre-K program particularly is based on something called the Heckman equation. Um, Jim Heckman at the University of Chicago Economics, uh, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist, developed this equation setting the return on investment, which is seven to 13% if you include health impacts on pre-K. It was paid for, but underwritten by J.B. Pritzker, who's the governor of Illinois now. So they've created this equation, and what they've said is, we can't shift the data for pre-K. Um, we can't make the numbers work for cognitive skills. Like, IQ hardens up at the age of 10. It doesn't work for the hedge funds. Like, that doesn't work. We don't have enough movement on the data dashboards to make that work, to get our ROI. We can manipulate character. Hmm. That's what we can manipulate. We can move character data on a dashboard. And this is these Ocean 5 big uh, personality traits. And then we can do that digitally through gamification. So what that looks like is there's something called Hatch. I'm sure there are many of these, but Hatch Education has something called a We Play Smart Table. And I mean, and this is real. It is a large play table. If you imagine a, like a big screen TV flat, on two sides of the, the, the display are fisheye lens cameras. And the children are supposed to come together to play at this table, like moving puzzle pieces and things, where the cameras track their social behaviors. Their social behaviors, not just how, how they're personal, but how they interact with others and are scored. Mm. And that is the data that drives these impact deals. And I confronted the woman who was in charge of this with, the, with Goldman Sachs with the flyer. I went to the Dirksen Senate building when they were all celebrating um, what's it called the Social Impact Partnerships Pay for Results Act. And they had a big you know, champagne toast over finally getting this passed, this seed money to start these impact markets. And I had to, I, you know, I'm a mom and I'm just like, I might not be able to stop this, but I'm gonna show up and tell you I know what's happening. And it's not okay. And I had my little half sheet flyer with the hatch surveillance play tables. And I said, this is wrong. You don't put at risk kids on a surveillance play table to profit Goldman Sachs. It's evil actually. And say, we're going to brainwash kids essentially for profit. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, if you understand it within a historic context, like clearly we've always done that to certain communities, to certain people's children. Like we have, like I'm not, I'm not acting shocked that this is happening, but like I felt compelled to show up and like with my little half sheet paper and say like, I know what you're doing. Like I am a, I'm bearing witness to this, that it's not okay. And I'm hoping maybe more people will know about it because it's shocking. If you see the hatch, we play smart table, you will be shocked to see it, that it's real. And that it actually, I have confirmation. So I went to, to Tulsa in January. There are centers where this is rolling out. Dallas, this is the Federal Reserve is part of a lot of this, the Dallas Fed. I visited Dallas and Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa is a target of a lot of this rollout. And they have something called EduCare. And, and this is going to be run through these EduCare franchise programs. And they're already using the We Play Smart Tables in EduCare in Tulsa. And I, I, I intervened at one of these impact events, these events where they were celebrating, you know, patting each other on the back over their impact, you know, investing opportunities. And again, calling them out, just like with my banner saying, kids are not impact investments. And, and I had confirmation from this is coming through something called Strive Together. They have collective impact programs all across the country. And they were like, I'm like, do you know about Amply, like digital identity? Do you know about these smart play tables? And they're like, well, of course. <laughs> like I'm in education, of course I know about the smart tables. So how does this affect <laughs> the relationship between the student and the teacher and uh, the child and the parent? <sighs> I mean, my concern, so, so this is something that I've been struggling with. Like, and again, like we're all sort of on this uneven ground is what, um, like, what is the world we want for our kids, right? And so on the one hand, there's, like, what does it mean to parent? Like, what does it mean to have time to care for your kids? 
you know, there's a whole argument around affordable childcare. Well, what if it means affordable childcare means your kid's on a surveillance play table? You know, what kind of world are we creating that you have to have two full-time parents, maybe each working two jobs to sustain a family so your kid can be on a surveillance play table for Goldman Sachs? Like these are these larger questions. Um, you know, and I'm not sitting here saying like any one parent should forego their, you know, having a satisfying career to do this work, but I think we really have to balance what corporate childcare, what franchise childcare means when it's starting to come with these predictive analytics and data analytics systems. Um, like we know kids shouldn't be on screens. Like we know behaviorally profiling, because it's not just that we play smart tables, they have these other little tablets that they're collecting all this data from. Um, so increasingly the teachers, and this is not just in pre-K, but in K-12 and higher, are supposed to be data managers. Like the kids interact with devices, and then the teachers queue up playlists under the, the pretense of personalized learning. And it's a consumer-based model. Like, as the teacher, I will queue up your 30 resources that you are to consume, digital resources, and then I will track your engagement with those resources, and then I will prepare your next playlist of items. And then every kid gets something different. And then increasingly, the teachers won't even be running the playlist, it will be AI. You know, increasingly that's what IBM is about, is that you are optimized through artificial intelligence. And I guess the question is, to what end, right? Do certain types of people get optimized to certain pathways? Because clearly with this fourth industrial revolution that's happening, the premise is, is that most people are gonna be dispossessed out of their jobs. So if you start profiling kids at the age of three at the surveillance play table and putting them in feedback loops, digital feedback loops that maybe they're not even aware they're in, essentially you can control their future. Um, and it, it might not even be, I mean, clearly even existing schools have always, I mean, we have to understand that compulsory education has been about social reproduction for the purposes of industry, right? It is, is to reinforce race and class and to stratify people and separate people into different groups. Like, I'm not under any, you know, dream that that isn't the, the truth. I mean, that is the function of compulsory education. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to do better. <laughs> and, and my question is, is once you put people isolated on devices, um, you lose knowledge sharing, right? Like you lose, you break community bonds. You have no space in which to collectively build um, something different. Essentially, your world is limited to what the digital interface says you have access to. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, we know even now within like what's going on with social media censorship around hot topics, um, if they don't want you to have the information, it will just be taken off. <laughs> And it's, it's kind of wild, the ability to um, rewrite history in real time yeah. is a trip. <laughs> what was it, 1984, the whole, like, the, when you rewrote the history and you put it in the burn? The, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, yeah. Last summer, I listened to the audiobook of that again, and I was like, wow, so much of this is so relevant. Like, it's super yeah. Um, I don't know. What, one of the things people say too is, well, this is just, you can't stop technology. This is just all inevitable and, you know, you can't beat them. You might as well join them. And what, what do you say to some of those <laughs> arguments? Well, so I've been like, so, uh, well, I guess it's understanding the long game, right? And, and there's part of me that's like, you know, they, this has been planned out for maybe 70 years or so, like since post-World War II. <laughs> Cybernetics, this cyborg future. And they haven't quite done it yet. So is that comforting or is that not comforting? <laughs> I'm like, does that mean it's almost here or that it's not ever gonna get here? Um, the thing that has really hit me within this past month is understanding that turning people into data isn't simply about surveillance. It isn't simply about extracting profit from people as managing them as data, is that extracting data from people is meant to feed machine learning systems, that there are a groups of people who know that they intend to catal like catalyze the singularity with this data, to actually um, 
create a future of sentient, you know, general artificial intelligence beyond the control of people. <laughs> And so this is something that I'm trying to come to grips with now. And, and I've known for a while, um, one of the big rabbit holes I fell down in doing education research was something called the Global Education Futures Forum, uh, which was led by Pavel Luksha, who's connected to Skolkovo in, in Russia, but has well-placed a panel of advisors around the globe. Um, Tom Vander Ark, who is formerly with the Gates Foundation and a, a key figure in virtual learning and ed tech and venture capital was that like the US contact. And I think they've actually recently taken the website down, which is very interesting to me. But if you if you like looking at their agenda, like Pavel Leksha, who's also connected to world skills building, um, was very much about also transhumanism. So this idea of you know, as we approach, you know, climate change end times that we would merge with the cloud, that we would merge with machines, that we would upload our consciousness to the internet and like be immortal, which sounds really wacky. And unless you actually look and see the people who are in that sphere, and there are a lot of very sophisticated thinkers who are thinking that this is something that we need to do. And, and um, even a few weeks ago, Whitney Webb had, a, an, an article that they were looking at a FOIA request about the AI task force of the US that was very concerned about keeping up with China with data and they're building AI and this idea like whoever gets to general and artificial intelligence first can essentially rule the world or rule the technological systems of the world. And that there are people out there who think that we need to merge with computers or we will be eliminated. And so that's a whole nother layer, right? Like it's not just about making money and controlling people, it's actually they would prefer to have us become data so that we can be batteries to fuel this future that really doesn't have place a place for humanity as we know it in it. Um, and I'm just not willing to go there yet um, because I think, yeah. well, I mean, I don't like, it's all in motion, right? And so this is something in my journey too under this lockdown situation um, connecting with people in different parts of the world who come from backgrounds of like faith and spiritual practice of all kinds, who are tapping into like energy systems. You know, and I know this may sound sort of, but I think the, under, the belief that we know all the things is pretty misguided. Like with string theory and particle physics and there are many things that we may not know and and there are many things that may go on faith and spirit and energy of which I feel like the people who are part of this transhumanist domination zone would like to put us in their box and capture that all up and put us in their digital box but then there's a counter group of people who may not fully be aware that they're working in a counterpoint to that this yin yang, who are the goodness of the world and energy in, in a free and liberated fashion. And I know this may sound like kind of new agey, but like if you look back to cybernetics, like that has been their goal since the, the post-World War II era, the, the mid-1940s, is to create the cybernetic world. And that's a very, in my mind, um, Western, white, male, dominating, <laughs> version of the world, that you can control it and you can have power and dominion over it. But then there's a whole big other part of the world that isn't that. And that's why, for me, I think coming at this from a anti-colonial mindset, like an eco-social, eco-feminist mindset, is the counterpoint to the tech bro mindset, maybe. When I have friends that are, you know, that think that kind of embrace a lot of these transhumanist ideas and, hey, what's the problem? We get to live, you know, we can live healthier and longer. I mean, healthier is questionable, but the idea that, you know, you, you get, there's a lot of these diseases that we can get rid of and we can, you know, extend our lives and, um, and it's like a tool, you know, you use a shovel and you can dig a hole and you can, you know, it's like seeing this as, as just tools to help liberate us, you know, more as opposed to seeing it as a tool that'll actually enslave us, which is I'm kind of more 
I mean, even the internet, when the internet came out, it's like, we're going to be able to share information and this is going to take the whole power structure down. And, and yeah. anymore, I can see it as just, it's a way, it's to, a ma it's a way to manipulate <laughs> people on a level that's never been exactly. existed before. Even though, yeah, there's, it's like a needle in a the haystack. There is a lot of information on there that's, that it was pre previously inaccessible, inaccessible yeah. to people. But um, I'm interested in that, you know, that, that, that a lot of people that are supportive of this are actually coming from an idealistic mindset of, hey, let's make the world a better place. And if technology can help us do that, why not? You have to have a structural analysis. The people who are running these systems are not benevolent actors. <laughs> the money that they give away is to certain ends to accomplish, to reinforce their own power and influence. It's not generative and redistributive. Um, and it's, it's dominating. I mean, to think that the people who run the cloud are not dominating us, that are just, they're somehow our benevolent overlords. I mean, I think it's incredibly misguided to think that. I don't think anyone can look and see the military contracts and the p prison contracts and all the things that Amazon Web Services and Google, um, these smart cities, we see what's happened in Toronto with them pushing back against sidewalk labs and saying, we don't want smart cities. Like we get where you're going with this and we don't trust you. The thing that I think is really critically important to understand in this moment, um, too, you know, because while we're under this lockdown situation, um, you know, clearly the 5G structure, infrastructure is rolling out. Um, the satellites, the OneWeb, the satellite Starlink, all of those are going up. Um, there's this convergence of technology both in the atmosphere and on the ground in terms of creating almost, you know, these fencing and control systems for people. You know, people are getting these digital identities. There probably seems like these, we're gonna end up, the digital health passports are gonna be the open door to give everybody you know, get, the, get your QR code and know what your status is so we can track you everywhere you go. Um, these systems are coming online now. And we, if you look towards like satellite linked livestock management, that's, that I believe is the model, is, is that you would have these satellites and you have cows with the tag in their ear, or, you know, goats or what, whatever collars that you can manage free range, right, through geofencing. Like, it's like your dog, electric dog fence, but you don't actually have the wire in it. You just, like when you get up close to the, the edge, you can bump up and the, you get a vibration. If you keep going, you get shocked. You know, we're almost to the point at which we can manage that with people. And if you imagine your UBI is on your phone, when you are, like, situated in different digital containment zones, like, they can control you at that level. They can control your access to um, basic needs of life, your shelter, your food, your water, your health care. Your, all of those things can be predicated if they're digital, linked into geofencing. And so um, Paul Romer, is, um, he's out of NYU, and he has been theorizing for some time, collaborating with the World Bank about things called charter cities, that you would have these carve outs within cities that were sort of like no rules apply and you can just make up your own rules for the free market. And that we would like manage refugee populations in that way. And so all of these pieces are running together. I think if we understand that Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are not really benevolent entities, they are there to, to aggregate more power unto themselves the tools that they're creating are not empowering us and disempowering them. They're essentially adding more and more layers of digital control onto us. Um, you know, the, the, these Silicon Valley people who would push all of this onto the masses and ed tech and have, um, all of it's about interoperable data because that's what they need for the predictive analytics. And um, there's a company called Clever that has QR code badges. Um, for kindergartners to log into their online ed tech education to, collect, to maximize the data collection because the little kids couldn't remember their passwords because they're just five years old. And so like you could decorate your QR code with fun stickers, but that's the data extraction purpose. And that's running through charter schools in the Bay Area and Rocket Ship Academy charter schools. The people who are in Silicon Valley who are running these systems don't send their kids to schools that do that to them. Their kids get blocks <laughs> and books.